But I was thinking today, if somebody had told me and Tom in about 1962 that he was going to be president of the uh, Songwriters Association and I was going to be uh, trying to save Ackworth history, I guess we'd have gagged on our beer. <laughs> but anyway, that's kind of what happened. So without further ado, let's give a big warm welcome to Tom Hall. Thank you, Mac. Appreciate it. Thank all y'all coming out tonight. It's, uh, it's Mac got me to do this, so he's been after me, and he got me to do the video, too, here with Dr. Scott, which is great. And uh, like he said, we moved here in 52 from Cartersville. I was born there in Cartersville. And uh, we built a house across from uh, the old Coulson Clark Ball field over here. My dad in Zoomer Poole, with uh, his dad, Rich Poole, built the house and we lived there for a few years and he he got the idea he wanted me to work real hard so he moved me out to uh, I moved Genevieve my sister's here moved both of us out to uh, Third Army Road to the chicken farm out there and uh, he gave me a no pitchfork about this wide and uh, he gave me a job of scattering chicken manure on those 20 acres out there and Genevieve and I used to have to get up and feed those chickens every morning before we went to school. We only had 12,000, which wasn't too many. <laughs> but anyway, out there, my dad was a preacher. He worked at Lockheed, but he was a lay preacher. A foot-washing Baptist preacher, if anybody knows what that is. <laughs> but uh, he gave me part of the profits from uh, selling the chicken manure to people to put on their lawn so I could buy me a guitar. So the first guitar I got was an old silver tone from uh, Sears and Robo. Later on in my career, I got to, uh, and it had Gene Autry's picture on the front of it on Champion raring up. Later on, I got to meet Gene Autry, and I got to escort him all night one night at an ASCAP Awards show in Nashville. And I got a picture, I think, on the slides of that. But anyway, uh, after that, so we, I started playing football in North Cobb, and uh, we graduated, I graduated in 63 with some of my friends here, Pitt Pruitt, I see him here. And, and I see uh, a lot of my friends here. Mickey Williams back there, he and I did a lot together. Moose. And uh, it's just great to see all y'all out. My, Dave, my cousin, David, right here, he, he stays in Alaska most of the time, but now he's moved to Woodstock, I understand. He came out tonight. So uh, he's caught a lot of fish up in Alaska. It's good to see you and your daughter here tonight. I appreciate it. And I think you work here at Ackworth now, don't you? Ackworth City Hall. It's great. But anyway, uh, my inspiration for music started with my dad. He taught me three chords and the truth. <laughs> and of course, I think the one that, uh, welcome Mike Donahue in the back, always late. <laughs> he told me 8.30. <laughs> yeah, my dad would play guitar and uh, he had several, six brothers who played all kinds of instruments and he inspired me and he taught me three chords. And, and my inspiration, though, uh, after that was a guy named, uh, this guy right here, Ricky Nelson. I used to watch Ricky Nelson every Wednesday night on the Ozzy and Harris show and never would miss it. And I'd lay in the floor waiting for him to come on to sing at the end of the show. And then when I got that guitar, I'd go back to my bedroom there in that old house. It didn't have any heat back there. But I'd sit and look in the mirror and try to imitate what he did, close my eyes and try to play some of his songs, but uh, he was my inspiration. But from that, from that, we know I went to Norcott, played football, basketball, track, graduated from there in 63, got the, I couldn't understand it, but uh, I got the uh, Most Outstanding Senior Award from the Atlanta Journal Cup that year, which really shocked me. And I guess it was because uh, the person that did the most sports and the most clubs and that sort of thing and had the best, great average. But uh, after that, I went to work for Lockheed. My dad, they couldn't afford to send me to college, so dad said, best thing you can do is get a job at Lockheed. And of course, we've all worked at Lockheed. I've had everybody in here at some point in time worked at Lockheed. I know Mac, I used to see Mac down in the bathroom shuffling cards. <laughs> he gambled a lot, you know. But, but anyway. Uh, you had to tell that. <laughs> I did. Anyway, I got drafted in 66 from Lockheed. I was in the hotel with a C-141, bucking rivets, and I had, was going to uh, 
the Georgia, University of Georgia Extension there at Southern Tech, and I dropped one course, and they drafted me in 66, and I uh, went to Fort Benning and went through basic training, and went to uh, 200 Passat Support Chinook helicopter outfit in Fort Benning, and we went straight to Alameda, California, and on an old World War II aircraft carrier, and went straight to Vietnam. And before we left, though, I went, uh, we had about a month to preserve those Chinooks and put them on the aircraft carrier. So we'd go downtown. This was the 19, first part of 1967. So we'd go down to uh, San Francisco, and I bought me an old guitar, an OK guitar at a pawn shop down there. And that's what I carried on that uh, aircraft carrier with me to play on the way to Vietnam. I, I had it the whole time I was there. And at night, I'd play that, and I had a guy playing with me. His name was Larry Peters. He was from Missouri. And this colonel heard us one night and said, man, y'all sound pretty good. He said, y'all like to play some venues around Vietnam. And I said, well, I'd get us out of the jungle. So on the weekends, he had a private H model Huey. So he'd take us, he'd fly us to different places like Sock Train and Dong Ha and Chu Lai and Vung Tao. And I love Vung Tao. That was kind of the R&R center of Vietnam. We played a lot of those places and it got us out of trouble some. But after that, I gave that guitar, which was a big mistake to another soldier who played a little bit, and we came home. And when I came home, I was dating a girl, Diane Howard, so a lot of you may know her. She was uh, my sweet girl, sweetheart going through high school, and uh, we got married in 68 and had two children. Tommy Jr., who's 50 now, he uh, works for a company uh, down here in Kennesaw, and my daughter, Latisse, who's 49 now. She teaches at Dean Russ Middle School up in Canton. This is her 28th year to teach. She's got her PhD in education and she's doing real well. But uh, after that, we, uh, I was at Lockheed and uh, we got a divorce. And uh, I was, uh, had gotten a degree from Georgia State University in management after I graduated from Kennesaw State, which was a two year school then, and went down to uh, Georgia State, got a degree in management. Got laid off from Lockheed when the C-5A blew up. And uh, didn't know what I wanted to do. I knew I had a heart's desire for music, but I didn't know how to get there, what to do. So I decided to go back to school. I went back to Georgia State and I got another degree in commercial music, copyright law. And they gave me an internship at Master Sound Studios on Spring Street in Atlanta. So I went over there and started working with Bob and Babs Richardson, and that was the biggest and main studio in Atlanta. So after I was working there for a while, I got to noticing that uh, this guy, Isaac Hayes, he was always in there playing the grand piano, writing songs. So uh, we, I became real good friends with Isaac, and he did, used to invite Belinda, my wife, sitting in the back back here, in the beautiful black and pink. He used to invite us over to his house, and we'd go over to Isaac's house and have dinner. So he was the first one to ever sign this guitar over here. And this guitar is a mainstay in my whole career. I bought that when I came back from Vietnam. It's an old FG-180 red label Yamaha. And I haven't changed the strings on that in about five years, but it never goes out of tune. It's amazing. But anyway, he was the first one to sign it, and we didn't have a Sharpie back then. We had a regular old pen. So he signed it in the grain of the guitar. And I said, well, if he did it, everybody else needs to do it the same way. So he was the first one to ever sign it. So I worked there for a few years, and I became the vice president of NARIS, which is the National Academy of Recording Arts and Sciences at Atlanta Chapter. And that's where I met a, name, a guy by the name of Bill Lowry. I don't know if you, anybody know who Bill Lowry is. He was probably the godfather of music in Georgia. He discovered people like Jerry Reed. He managed Jerry Reed for a number of years. Joe South, Tommy Rowe, uh, Billy Joe Royal, all those people. The Atlanta Rhythm Section worked with him. And I got to work with all those guys. And uh, Bill came to me one day after I was working at Master Sound. He said, I'd like to hire you to be my song club. And I said, wow, what's a song plug? <laughs> I didn't know what it was. But he, he, he hired me for $75 a week. I wasn't making anything at Master Sound. I was just an intern. But anyway, I went to work for Bill. And Bill introduced me to Joe South's catalog of songs, Jerry Reed's catalog of songs, and Ray Stevens. Uh, Ray, 
he managed Ray and published all Ray Stevens stuff as well. So Bill would send me to Nashville once a week, or once one week out of every month, and he'd send me to Los Angeles to pitch songs. Well, during that time, we had this idea that Atlanta needed a songwriters association. So a guy by the name of Larry Latimer, who wrote, uh, I don't know if you ever heard, Nothing Runs Like a Deer, John Deere, he wrote that theme song. Well, he and I, and a guy named Steve Weaver, we started the Atlanta Songwriters Association in 78 with the help of Zell Miller. And that's when I became real good friends with Zell because he appointed me to the first Georgia Music Hall of Fame Committee. And we had our first induction ceremony in 78, right after 78. And the first two people we inducted was Ray Charles and Bill Lowry. And when they made Georgia, uh, the official theme song of Georgia, state of Georgia, I had the honor of escorting Ray Charles down on the legislative floor and sitting him at the piano to play the song. And if you ever seen the movie Ray, you'll see that little episode in that movie. It wasn't me in the movie, but they had another guy doing it, but I was the one escorting him down there. And anyway, that was a thrill for me. And, uh, and Zell really helped a lot. He came up to a lot of our meetings that we had at uh, Vito Blondo's Cafe on Claremont Road. And uh, later on, Zell became a real close friend. And of course, Blondo and I got to visit with him at his house a couple of times before he passed away. But after that, uh, I used to take Joe South and some other songwriters up to Nashville to do showcases. And uh, Francis Preston, who had BMI, which is Broadcast Music Incorporated, and that's a performing rights organization that collects money from radio stations, TV stations, et cetera, to pay royalties to the writers that write songs and publish songs. Well, I went up there and I took Joe and a bunch of other folks, and they got to meeting different people. Well, I met a guy named uh, Buddy Killen. He owned Tree Publishing Company. Now, Buddy was from... Uh, Alabama, Muscle Shows. He played bass for Hank Senior. And he took a shine to me. He really liked what I was doing. Let's see if I got him on there. Uh, I'll get to them in a minute. There's Bill Lowry. If you've ever seen a picture of him, he's the one that hired me away from Master Sound. I'll show you this. I'll, anybody recognize that picture? That was Itchy Brother. Better known as the Kentucky Headhunters today, but I first met them, I was working at, uh, I need to back up a little bit, I was working at a place called Perfection Sound Studio from Spring Street in Smyrna. And I was uh, making tape copies and that sort of thing. They walked in one day and we did a session on them. And uh, they told me, uh, come see them sometime in Kentucky. And later on I did, I went up there and I moved them to Atlanta. I put them in an apartment complex down in Smyrna and we used to play all the uh, sock hops. We used to play all the, the dances at different high schools around. I took them to uh, University of Georgia, Georgia Tech, and all these places to play these uh, frat houses. And uh, then they kind of split up, went back to Kentucky. But anyway, uh, Bill was probably my mentor, my inspiration to be in music. He taught me a lot about music publishing. He was uh, almost like a second father to me. And he never would pay much, but he always gave bonuses. Every holiday, whether it be Easter, whether it be Halloween, he'd give you a bonus, which inspired me. And then uh, there's Zell. I work with Zell a lot. And that's Buddy Killen. He's one of the own tree publishing company. And uh, he brought me to Nashville, paid my way up there. I met with him and he says, Tom said, uh, what would it take for me to hire you to come to work and move to Nashville? I said, well, how about $300 a week? He said, well, if you'd ask for five, I'd give it to you. And so that's when I learned to always ask for more than what you expect. You know? <laughs> but anyway, he paid, uh, he gave me $1,700 and Belinda and I loaded up a U-Haul truck and we moved to Nashville, and it was the last part of 1980. And he gave me um, a nice office, which was Hank Cochran's old office. I don't know if you know who Hank Cochran is. But uh, this is a picture of Hank right here. He wrote, uh, Make the World Go Away, Eddie Arnold's big hit. 
He wrote uh, The Chair for George Strait. There's so many, many different hits he wrote. And he signed this for me several years ago before he passed away. And anyway, I worked there for uh, three years. And then my second year, Maggie Cavender, who was executive director of the National Songwriters Association International, really took a, took a liking to me. And, and they voted me in as the president of the National Songwriters Association. And uh, I did that for a whole year. We raised a lot of money with Barbara Mandrell and Charlie Pride. Went out to Fort Worth with, to uh, Billy Bob's. We did a big show with Charlie Pride out there and raised, uh, I think that show we raised about $12,000 for the organization. And we got, Barbara Mandrell did one for us and we raised uh, right at 40000 to help the organization move along. And during that time I had three number ones that I had pitched at uh, Tree Publishing. And uh, one, well, two of them was by Lee Greenwood. You know who Lee Greenwood is? And I told Lee this story, but he didn't believe me. He thought I was joking. I said, Lee, you had your first number one song because I stayed in the bathroom too long. And he said, how's that? And I said, well, I was making a tape copy for Jerry Crutchfield, who produces Lee, and uh, to a reel-to-reel, -to, -reel to a cassette. And I went to the bathroom, and when I came, I, I got detained in there, and when I came back, the second song on the reel had already gone on to the cassette. I just left it on there, pulled the lyric, took it down to Crutchfield, who produces Lee, and he called me back later that afternoon. He said, Tom, he said, thanks for the cassette, but that second song on there is the one that we want to cut. And I said, what well, was a mistake? And he said, well, we're cutting. And it was his first number one record, Somebody's Gonna Love It. And, uh, but, you know, things can really happen weird sometimes. But after that, I uh, made a lot of speeches when I was uh, the, the president of the National Songwriters Association. And a guy named Hal Coleman, uh, not Hal Coleman, excuse me, he just mentioned Hal Coleman a minute ago. He's an old friend of mine. But Hal, uh, Hal David, yeah, thank you. Hal David was the president of ASCAP and he had written all these hits for Dion Warwick and all these different people and he wanted to know if I'd come to work for ASCAP. Now ASCAP is the American Society of Composers, Authors, and Publishers. And if you, that's a performing rights society just like BMI is, or CSAC. There's three of them in the States. They collect money for songwriters for their royalties in publishing and songwriting. And I agreed to do it. So I went over there. And he told me that he wanted to groom me to be the next head of ASCAP. And I said, well, that'd be great. So I went over there and uh, I was working for a lady named Connie Bradley, who's Jerry Bradley's wife. Jerry Bradley was a VP of RCA Records. He, he produced a lot of people. He did the first outlaw record with Waylon and Willie. And, and uh, anyway, I was over there for 10 years. But during that time, I signed over 800 writers and that's when I got a lot of these people to sign my guitar. There's Hank, and there's two of my other real good buddies I should have mentioned. Harlan Howard, he's the one that came up with the line, Three Chords and the Truth. And then my good friend Curly Putman, he called me the week before he died. He wrote uh, Green Green Grass at Home. Mm -hmm. He wrote uh, He Stopped Loving Her Today, D-I-V-O-R-C-E. Bobby Braddock, so many other songs. He was a jewel of a guy. We used, Blunt and I used to go to his house for dinner. He lived out in Lebanon, Tennessee. But he called me twice on the same day, a week before he died. He said it was a mistake the second time. He just wanted to tell me he loved me the last time. And I thought that was a neat thing that he would do that. And uh, I drove all the way up there to his funeral and drove right back because I, I didn't want to miss it. And one of the people when I worked at Tree, Amy Lou Harris, became a friend and she signed my guitar. That's Amy Lou. We had t-shirts made up called I Love You, Amy Lou. And there's Dolly. She, uh, we did an administration thing for Dolly in her catalog when I was working there. Of course, she was a little heavier there than she is today. But she signed my guitar as well. And that was in the old Tree building, which is Sony ATV now. And then Garth, I became real good friends with Garth when he first came to town. And Belinda and I used to take him and Sandy, his first wife, to dinner. And uh, he's, he's just like he always was. We were at the ASCAP Awards a couple of years back, and 
he was doing an interview and the cameras were all on him and Tricia. Of course, 